San Francisco on December 16, 1993. Thank you, Judge Thompson. May it please the court. My name is Mark Levy. I'm the Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Division at the Department of Justice, and I'm appearing on behalf of the defendant appellants in these cases. I would like to reserve three minutes of my argument time for rebuttal. Now, the issue in this case is the validity of Petty Officer Meinhold's discharge under the military so-called old policy governing homosexuals in the service. Judge Hatter enjoined Meinhold's discharge and went on, even though this case is not a class action, he went on to extend sweeping injunctive relief to any person worldwide who is in or may seek to join the armed forces. And we submit that Judge Hatter committed fundamental legal error for three principal reasons. First, the scope of the injunction is grossly overbroad in extending relief to people other than Meinhold who are not before the court and who have not been certified as a class. Second, the district court erred in even reaching the constitutionality of the old policy because Meinhold failed to exhaust his administrative remedies and because there are non-constitutional issues that the court should have resolved before deciding the constitutional question. And third, on the constitutional merits, uh, we believe the district court failed to give adequate deference to the military and also erred in holding the old policy to be irrational under the rational basis test. Now let me begin with the overbreath issue on the scope of the injunction. This is the issue on which the Supreme Court granted the government a stay pending the appeal on the merits in this court. Injunctions, of course, are to be narrowly drawn. And the overbroad injunction here, granting relief beyond Meinhold to people who are not before the court and are not part of a class, was legally erroneous for any number of reasons. First, Meinhold had no standing to assert the rights of these other people. Indeed, there's been litigation, as the court knows, all over the country. Other service members have not been reluctant to assert their own rights uh, uh, in those cases. And second, the order was fundamentally unfair to the government because, in effect, it was a one-way, after-the-fact, the estoppel against the government. Let me explain what I mean by that. If we had won, if the government had won before Judge Hatter, the only person who would have been bound by that is Meinhold. But simply because we lost before Judge Hatter, suddenly the world at large, every service member in the service or who may seek to join the service later, gets the benefit of that injunction. That sort of one-way estoppel is precluded quite clearly by the Supreme Court's decision in the Mendoza case that we cite. And the third essential point I'd make about the, the overbreath what, is if that get, what if you get a decision by the Supreme Court that uh, strikes down uh, the policy uh, for some fundamental reasons that would, of necessity, apply to everybody uh, in the similar situation? Then wouldn't it apply to persons, uh, as a practical matter, it's got to apply to people other than those before the court? As a practical matter, it would, and that's one of our grounds of distinction for the Soto Lopez case in the Second Circuit that mm -hmm. Mr. Meinhold relies on. Uh, the Supreme Court in this and a lot of other respects is simply unique. Uh, and a nationwide, a decision by the Supreme Court by definition is nationwide and binding. The same is not true for decisions in the lower courts. And as Mendoza explains, there are good systemic reasons why a ruling in one court should not constitute offensive collateral estoppel against the government on an important issue of constitutional law. The third problem with Judge Hatter's injunction is that he failed to comply with the procedures or requirements of Rule 23 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, which are designed to promote fairness not only for the defendants 
but also for the plaintiffs to make sure, for example, that there aren't any conflicts of interest and that the class is adequately represented. We don't know what would have happened in this case if class procedures had been followed. Just to give you a couple of examples, uh, Mr. Meinhold waived any right to monetary damages because he wanted to be in the district court and, and on appeal in this court rather than the federal circuit where the Woodward decision is favorable precedent to us. We don't know how other class members would have regarded the waiver of monetary relief. Similarly, as I said before, other class members or, or putative purported class members uh, have wished to sue on their own behalf in courts around the country. Those are all issues that would have had to be uh, resolved if the proper procedures had been followed and they weren't even addressed in this case. Now, the overbreath of Judge Hatter's injunction is particularly egregious here, since it would prevent implementation of the so-called new policy that was worked out between the President and the Congress and has now been signed into law. Even though the new policy has never been applied to Meinhold or to anyone else, the Department of Defense has not yet promulgated the regulations that are necessary to implement the new policy. And I want to stress this, the constitutionality of the new policy was neither presented to nor considered by Judge Hatter. But I don't quite understand that part of your argument. Judge Hatter never considered the constitutionality of the new Abs policy. Absolutely correct. And yet nor the, should we. Nor should you. I quite agree with that. The problem is that even though that was not adjudicated, the injunction is, dis is, is drafted so indiscriminately broadly that it does condemn the new policy, even though the merits of the new policy were never considered. Only if it's the same or some future court decides it is. Well, on the face of it, the injunction says there are certain things the government can't do, and some of those are things that the new policy authorizes and requires the government to do. And what we would like this court to do is to reverse the overbroad portion of the injunction so that the new policy is not peremptorily enjoined and can be subject to adjudication in a, in a proper suit later on. You assist me by telling me what the difference is between the new policy, which has not been implemented, and the one under which Meinhold was, uh, was that the process was conducted. There are a number of differences, and again, let me say that the Department of Defense regulations haven't yet been promulgated, and those will uh, flesh out what the policy will be. There certainly are substantial differences in what's come to be called the don't ask and don't pursue part, that is, uh, service members will no longer be asked questions about their homosexuality and they won't be investigated unless there's credible evidence to believe that there is a ground for discharge. On the discharge portion of the, of the new statute itself, which is the part that, that's analogous to what's involved here, the statute does several things. First, it makes it clear that homosexuality as such is a private matter and is not a ground for discharge. Second, it clarifies, and I will come to this later in a more detailed discussion of the old policy, but it clarifies that there is a rebuttable presumption and sets out what is necessary for the service member who declares his homosexuality to rebut it and remain in the service. That the old policy had a rebuttable presumption lurking within it, but not on its face? It is uh, our position, and let me, let me turn to that uh, since it's come up. I would say before doing that that we don't think Judge Hatter properly adjudicated the constitutional issue at all, first because Meinhold hadn't exhausted his administrative remedies, uh, and second because there was a non-constitutional estoppel issue before Judge Hatter that he should have decided uh, before he reached the constitutional issue. And this court's en banc decision in Watkins is precisely on point uh, on that issue. So well, we think... To answer, to answer Judge Armour's question, there's nothing, there's nothing in the policy statement which gives the, which creates or gives the, uh, the member an opportunity to refute the uh, homosexual conduct. I think there is, and let me go through the... Uh, Would you point that out to The me? regulations. It, it is a little bit complicated. I can see that. And one of the improvements that the new policy makes is to set forth right on the face of this statute that there is a rebuttable presumption I understand that you're saying that by implementing the old policy, you in effect uh, develop a process by which it can, by which the member can refute uh, any uh, any well any I guess presumption that they uh, that they're engaged in homosexual conduct. That's right. It's inherent in the logical structure uh, of the of the. Uh, well, would you give policy. that? Would you cite that to me? The particular provision of. Uh, of the policy that is in effect at the time of Meinhold's discharge. I will. It's attached as an addendum to our opening brief. Uh, it's DOD Directive 1332.14. That is the governing uh, regulation. And let me 
summarize it briefly if I can because it is complicated and then walk you through it and show you precisely where the rebuttable presumption is and how it works. We start from the premise that the military can prescribe homosexual conduct as a ground for discharge. Every court of appeals to consider that issue has agreed, including this court in Pruitt and the D.C. Circuit in Stephan, and we don't understand Meinhold to dispute that. The uh, discharge policy in statement cases under the old policy is closely connected to the conduct prohibition and provides for discharge where there is a sufficient and unrebutted likelihood of homosexual conduct. In other words, it's directed to conduct and does not authorize discharge based on status or orientation. And this is one of the central points. Well, it may or may not, but my question is slightly different, and that is what difference does that make if, in fact, what happened in this discharge proceeding was an instruction, if I understand it correctly, by the Naval Legal Officer that the only thing that was material was the statement, I am a homosexual. Well, what the legal officer meant by that was that this case was being processed under the statement branch and not under the conduct branch, and that much is correct, but that's not the same thing as saying is that there's no opportunity to rebut the presumption and remain in the military. Well, let's talk about the statement a little bit, if we, w if, if we can. The, the statement, I am a homosexual, basically goes to the status of what that person perceives him or herself to be. You could, on the other hand, have a statement, I am a sexually active homosexual, which would carry with it a slightly different connotation and would be susceptible of a finding that conduct would, would result or had occurred. Or you could have a statement, I am a homosexual who desires to have sex with X of the same gender. And that would pretty clearly connote conduct. Right. Now the but the, but the, my question is, just the statement, I am a homosexual alone, carries with it no connotation of conduct. Well, that's where the rebuttable presumption comes in. The regulation begins by saying that people who, this is in paragraph 1A of that directive, people who engage in homosexual conduct or who by their statements demonstrate a propensity to engage in homosexual conduct oh, yes. seriously impair. I understand, but where does the statement, I am a homosexual, show a propensity to engage in conduct, by contrast with the two other formulations which I gave you? The two other formulations are easier, I quite agree, but the way that the statement, I am a homosexual, gives rise to a presumption is the way the military has interpreted its own regulations, which are entitled to deference from this court. The regulations in section B1 define what a homosexual is. It's someone who engages in, intends to engage in, or desires to engage in homosexual conduct. But where does the statement connote any of those three things? It says in section, it's on the right-hand column, it's number two toward the bottom. It says the member has stated that he or she is a homosexual, picking up the definition that I've just read, unless there is a further finding that the member is not a homosexual. What that does is this. The first part of the regulation reflects the lessons of human experience that people who are homosexual, like heterosexuals, are likely to engage in conduct consistent with that sexuality. Even if it's illegal? I think that is the uh, inference that the military is entitled to start from. But that's only a presumption. Some people don't act in accordance with that presumption, perhaps for the reason Your Honor gives or some other. And so it's the second part of that, the unless clause, that gives the member an opportunity to show that even though he's declared that he's a homosexual, he should remain in the service because he is not a homosexual in the sense that that term is defined. That is, he doesn't engage in, intend to engage in, or desire to engage in homosexual acts. You're getting back to status. You're getting back to status. They have to prove that they're not a homosexual. No, they have to improve. They have to prove. You can take the word homosexual out of it. They have to prove that they don't engage in acts, intend to engage in acts, or desire to engage Which in Which is the way you define homosexual act. That's what a homosexual is. That's so they, right, have, they have to prove that they do not come within that definition. But it's not the status of a homosexual. The definition itself is directed to conduct. And it's a confusing formulation, and that's why the new policy gets away and from why it. Why is there any difference between statement and conduct, if that's true? Because conduct is conduct that's actually occurred. A statement gives rise to a presumption about future conduct. Uh, which, the mil which, this, which the service member then can rebut in an appropriate case. 
And let me say that... Um, and that argument that you've just advanced, by that argument, uh, a homosexual would have the uh, power under the old regulation to prove that he is not a homosexual. And by proving he's not a homosexual, he would have to establish that he did not engage in homosexual activity, did not desire to, and did not intend to. He'd have to establish all of that. That's correct. Uh, suppose he were to say, I am a homosexual. I have the desire to engage in homosexual acts. But I recognize that that's contrary, perhaps, to law in some jurisdictions. Certainly, it's contrary to the military regulations and I'm going to obey the military regulation. Then the Navy would say, that's tough, you're out, because we know that if you have the desire, you will act on it, even though it is against the regulation. Now, how can the Navy make that conclusion in that statement? Well, there are two things. One, I agree that the word desire is somewhat ambiguous, and again, it's not found in the new policy, but the military has interpreted its own regulation on the word desire to be consistent with the word propensity I read at the beginning, that is, a likelihood of future conduct. So it's not a latent well, you, desire. Then you equate desire with likelihood, and because the desire is there, it's likely it's going to happen. No, no, the other way around. That regardless of whether there is the de a desire in the sense of a latent tendency, and I should add the word tendency was eliminated from the regulation in 1981, regardless of whether there is a desire in that sense, that's not the way the military has read its own regulation. And unless the service member is unable to prove that he won't engage in future acts, the burden's on him to rebut the presumption. Well, that's the new regulation. No, even under the old regulation, the presumption is that he, someone who states that they're a homosexual will be discharged unless they can demonstrate <coughs> that they won't engage in, they don't intend to, and don't desire to engage in homosexual conduct. And do you say that was the opportunity afforded uh, Mr. Reinhold? I think it was, although if the court isn't clear about the circumstances of this case, we wouldn't object to a remand to the military for further proceedings. But let me say that uh, Mr. Meinhold himself, I think, recognized this. Uh, he did put in testimony from a couple of doctors and also from some of his service members, uh, his, his uh, colleagues, to show that he ought to be able to remain in the service. Now, I think he misunderstood somewhat the nature of the rebuttable presumption. His evidence was designed to show that conduct shouldn't be presumed from the statement rather than that he was a particular sort of person who wouldn't engage in the conduct. But as he uh, characterized it at the administrative hearing, and I'm quoting now from pages 34 and 35, he said that the regulation, quote, focuses on acts, intentions, and desires for bodily conduct. It does not focus on orientation. It does not focus on status. I submit to you, members of the board, a person's sexual orientation is strictly irrelevant under the regulation. The policy is directed toward persons who engage in homosexual conduct or who by their statements demonstrate a propensity to engage in homosexual conduct. And he went on at page 65 to make the very point I'm making today and said that the, quote, logical structure, the logical structure of the old policy established that a person who made a statement of homosexuality nonetheless could remain in the service. Now let me make one final point about uh, the Claiborne case and the argument about prejudice. It's alleged that even if, this con even if the old policy is, as I've asserted, conduct directed, uh, nonetheless, it's impermissible because it's based on prejudice, and the Supreme Court's decision in Claiborne strikes that down. This case is completely different from Claiborne. First of all, Claiborne was not a military case, and there was no question of deference to the military. But beyond that, the nature of the governmental interest is completely different. In Claiborne, uh, the Supreme Court, in the relevant passage, talked about... Uh, I want to get the quote right. The court concluded that, quote, mere negative attitudes or fear unsubstantiated by factors which are properly cognizable in a zoning proceeding uh, cannot be the basis for the classification. In other words, in Claiborne, it was not the responsibility of the Zoning Commission to decide whether neighbors could get along and live and work together. Precisely as the, the opposite is true here, under the concept of unit cohesion, which is critically important, it is exactly the responsibility of the military command to make sure that there's a cohesive and properly functioning group of service members who are dedicated to each other and to the good of the unit. And that is exactly what the prohibition on uh, homosexuals was designed to, uh, to accomplish. I would like to reserve may the I, May I ask yeah. just two questions, if I may? 
Well, just presume hypothetically that you have a heterosexual who's engaged in a homosexual has engaged in a homosexual act. What 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 under the process what? How would he be handled, or how would he or she be handled? Well, there's a specific provision in the regulations, going back to the directive we talked about before. That's under um, C1? Uh, yes, under C1. And All right, there let's is take a the other situation, then. Apparently, he could come in, and he or she could come in and say, well, this is not my normal activity. But it's important to understand the reason for that. The reason is that as a predictor of future conduct, if it's not the person's normal activity, it's very unlikely to arise again. So the person has made exactly the same sort of rebuttal showing that we say in a statement case the service member has to make. In both instances, the question is what is the likelihood of future conduct, the propensity, if you will, for future conduct. And in, even in an act case, if there's no propensity for future conduct and the service member can demonstrate that to the satisfaction of the military, he's entitled to stay in. And that's exactly parallel to the statement situation. But if a homosexual commits a homosexual act, the situation is different. Only because the assumption is, unless rebutted, that homosexuals who engage in homosexual acts will continue to engage. So the status, so the status is a determining factor. That it is not a determining factor. It is a predictor, if you will, of conduct. And the service member is given an opportunity to show why, in his or her particular case, it's not a good predictor. The instance of the so-called celibate homosexual, which I think is a very inartfully named term makes it clear that somebody who can live by the rules and understands the importance of subordinating his or her individuality to the collective interests of the uh, service and conform to the rules that have been established for the good of the unit, that person, even though a declared homosexual, can remain in the service. That's flatly inconsistent with the conclusion that it is status or orientation that's the ground for discharge. Is the Stefan case, has cert been granted on the D.C. Circuit case? The government is still uh, considering what to do in the Stefan case. We have until December 31st to file a rehearing petition and another 45 days after that to seek certiorari. And when will the new policy be implemented in, or do you have any idea? I can't tell you precisely. The regulations are be being drafted now, and I suspect it will not be too much longer, but there's not a definite date. The statute has been signed. Mr. Levy, uh, you mentioned... Uh, Cohesiveness, I think, of the unit was one of the things that you're concerned about here. And um, in the uh, red brief filed by Man Meinhold at page 29, uh, Meinhold cites to uh, a general board, Secretary of the Navy, uh, position on African Americans back in 1942 where it was stated then that men on board ship live in particularly close association in their messes. One man sits beside another. Their hammocks or bunks are close together in their common tasks. They work side by side. And it goes on and it talks about, particularly in a gun, gun crew, uh, you need this uh, cohesiveness of a unit. And how could you possibly have this with persons of different races? And uh, that was endorsed by the uh, Secretary of the Navy's uh, general board back in 1942, that's since proved to be totally false. And yet I hear some of the same assertions being made now when we talk about this cohesiveness of the group, uh, discipline, uh, morale, and that sort of thing. Now, I think the situations are entirely different, and how? I would refer the court to the uh, testimony on the new statute, which gets into this very situation and some of the findings of Congress that I don't have time to read. But the differences are at least twofold. One is race, for a variety of constitutional and historical reasons, is different from almost anything else in our country and is subject to a, a much different, more, uh, more rigorous test. But second, I would point out that when the military was desegregated, it was the Congress, I'm sorry, it was the President that did that. It wasn't a court imposing that upon the, the military as a matter of constitutional doctrine. Rather, it was President Truman deciding that this was in the best interest of the country. That shows the importance of deference, and that's a fundamental argument here for the government, deference and rational basis review. But the importance of deference to the informed expert prof professional judgment of the military and the president who have the constitutional responsibility to carry out uh, the defense of our nation. If and when the president and the military think that further steps can be taken, I trust that those steps will be taken, just as Truman took the steps back in the 1940s. But at this point, 
uh, even under the new policy, uh, it's been determined by Congress and the President working together with the Joint Chiefs that that is as far as the country is able to go at this point. Well, we're going to let you sit down, Mr. Levy, but don't leave the room. I hope you will <laughs> stand up again as well. Thank you. All right. For Mr. Meinhold, we're going to now hear from uh, uh, Mr. McGuire. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> May it please the Court, my name is John McGuire of the firm K. Scholler, Fearman, Hayes, and Handler, and I'm here on behalf of Petty Officer Keith Meinhold, the defendant appellee. Members of the court, the government is in, is before you today, asking you to vacate a lower court's judgment and order, and to allow it to continue enforcing a policy that it refused to defend before the district court in summary judgment proceedings. That's contradicted by no less than four studies that the Department of Defense itself commissioned precisely on this issue, that has been shown through the record in summary judgment proceedings to be unrelated to the advancement of any legitimate military objective and which the record demonstrates actually harms some of the objectives that the government recites as the purpose of the regulation. Mr. McGuire, uh, as you're aware, there's, we have an obligation uh, in general uh, not to reach constitutional issues uh, if there's any other available choice. In this case, there was evidence adduced uh, by Meinhold um, that tends to show that in the past he had been asked and had responded that he was a homosexual in connection with medical exams or whatever. And the Navy apparently countered it, whether with evidence or just, just orally, it's unclear to me from the record. But you argue in your brief that we shouldn't look at an equitable estoppel alternative simply because that would have required trial, whereas this constitutional issue could be resolved on summary judgment. Now, that strikes me as a, as a strange uh, a doctrine, I, and, and, and I, I don't know that there's any authority for it, and I would appreciate your explaining why we shouldn't uh, send it back. I'd, li I'd like to address ground. that, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, Judge Reimer, the authority for it is Rule 56 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. It's ironic to me that the government comes before you today telling this court that the district court should have ruled and granted Meinhold judgment on the estoppel claim, when in summary judgment proceedings before the district court, the government put 99.9% .9 of its effort into defeating the estoppel claim. It went so far as to track down the treating physician who gave Petty Officer Meinhold one of his exams when he re-enlisted in the Navy something like over five years ago, and got a declaration from him and dug up his old physical exams. And as you point out, Judge Reimer, those papers and that declaration say something. What they say, I'm not so sure, but they at least create a disputed fact as to whether or not the Navy ever asked Petty Officer Meinhold to identify his sexual orientation. The papers, as you may recall, Judge Reimer, indicate something like sexual tendencies, one of them says, and another says homosexuality, and it was marked by the physician, not Meinhold, we claim. The government claims it was marked by Meinhold. So there are some disputes there as to what was asked and what was answered between Petty Officer Meinhold and the Navy. That issue will have to go to trial. We concede that we can't win that issue as a matter of summary judgment. What difference does the fact that it have to go to trial mm -hmm. make on whether we should reach the constitutional issue? We wait, wait on that. It's simply this, Judge Reimer. Rule 56 entitles Petty Officer Meinhold to ju judgment as a matter of summary judgment if he proves that there are no disputed material facts. And we've proven that. What the government is asking you to do today without reciting any authority, is to carve out an exception from Rule 56, where if a litigant claims a makes a constitutional claim and a variety of others, they're not entitled to summary judgment on the constitutional claim so long as all of the other issues can be decided as a matter of summary judgment as well. There is no exception of that sort in Rule 56, and we claim that one doesn't exist. Petty Officer Meinhold demonstrated that he was entitled to summary judgment on the constitutional claim, and the court properly granted it to him. Now, to force him to go back to court now and sit through trial knowing that the uh, regulation underlying it is already unconstitutional would violate that rule and would be in violation of Celotex as well, because under Celotex, the government failed to present uh, facts demonstrating that there was a dispute, and so judgment should be granted for the litigant. Um, that, that assumes that the regulation is unconstitutional. 
uh, that argument does. The district court has already so found it to be. Well, yeah, Johnson. but the case is now on appeal to us, and it's a little like the, the umpire, you know, when he says it ain't nothing till I call it. Yes, sir. So uh, have, have, can you really say that uh, we have an unconstitutional uh, regulation here at this point, and Mr. Meinhold would have to go through this whole trial and the expense and what was all over, it would be unconstitutional anyway. Well, uh, though, Judge Thompson, this rule that courts apply, uh, it's a sort of a rule of economy that courts apply, it, it doesn't assume that the finding, the, the government's argument with regard to resolution of the estoppel argument presumes that the regulation is unconstitutional. What the government is saying is, even if it is unconstitutional, go back and find out if you could find in judgment in favor of him for a different reason. So I think that that really addresses your issue. I mean, I do, I do agree, absolutely. You will be reviewing this. You will decide whether this regulation is constitutional or not. Or but some that's higher authority. The Supreme Court will decide <laughs> yes. that. Yes. Um, but we may be midwives in this process. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that is not what part of the government's. So the government isn't arguing that the reason why the estoppel claim has to be resolved is because the regulation is constitutional. They're arguing, even if it is unconstitutional, make him go back to trial and sit through trial on the estoppel before the court finally rules on the issue. Your argument is essentially one of uh, judicial economy and common sense. That you're well, I think it's really a question of a policy of common sense, which the courts you know, have properly developed over time, versus a statute implemented by Congress, the FRCP, mm -hmm. that entitles a litigant to judgment. Okay? We've met all the requirements necessary for that judgment, and the government is saying, no, go back to court because there's some exception, or there ought to be. And I, I will point out to the court again that despite the exhaustive briefing in this case, there really is no case pointed out by the government to support this proposition. And although they make an effort with the Spectre Motor case, which you may recall from the government's brief, it has absolutely nothing to do with the resolution of non-constitutional claims as a prerequisite to a constitutional determination. It had to do with a remand to a state Supreme Court for a proper interpretation of its tax law in order to determine, this is sort of along the lines of what you were saying, Judge Thompson, in order to determine whether there was a constitutional violation. Absolutely. This is a completely separate issue. We acknowledge, or the government will acknowledge there's a constitutional violation, but they want further proceedings anyway, just to see if there is some other way of deciding the case. And that is far more than the sort of economical policy that the courts had implemented resolution of constitutional claims. I do know that there is one thing that I definitely want to get to because it exhausted most of your time with the government, and that had to do with what the nature of this regulation really is, whether it discharges, what does, what is the, the relevant evidentiary issue that must be resolved before a service member must be discharged under this policy. And um, I would also like to remind the court that this policy, which Mr. Levy is in court defending today, has been repudiated by the Commander-in-Chief and President of the United States. It's been done away with. And the, the as I will demonstrate, the m relevant evidentiary issue is sexual orientation. And as Mr. Levy just conceded to you, they don't think that they need to exclude service members based on sexual orientation anymore, or at least that's what their new policy purports to do. It says that it's okay if you're gay. We're just worried about a couple of other issues like are other people going to be upset about it if they find out? This regulation discharges service members for being gay or lesbian, period. I feel as though, and Petty Officer Meinhold and I both feel this way, that we started litigating a completely different case when we came up to the Ninth Circuit. When we were in the administrative discharge hearing, as Mr. Levy quoted from the transcript, I made a pitch to the military board that it had to make some sort of a finding of conduct of possible conduct, likely conduct, almost certain conduct, but some finding of conduct. And what, what the legal advisor who sits as a judge to the military board instructed the members of the board was that conduct is irrelevant. The only determination the board need make is whether Petty Officer Meinhold is gay. He said he's gay. He's out. Let me, let me ask you a question on that, if I may. It has something to do with the uh, exhaustion of administrative remedies. Um, the regulation, it seems to me, is susceptible to two readings. One of them could be that a statement, I am a homosexual, that is status, alone, is enough. And that apparently is the position that the Naval Legal Advisor and in turn the board took in this case. Another possible construct is to make the regulation consistent with the objective, such that the statement itself 
must connote action, activity, desire, intent, um, propensity to engage in conduct. That arguably would be a constitutional interpretation, arguably, uh, if hinged to conduct. More clearly, the former has a lot of constitutional problems. Why is it inappropriate, in your view, therefore, to say that given an obligation to construe regulations constitutionally, if it's possible to do so, the Navy procedures ought not to be given another chance at construing the statute in a const arguably constitutional uh, way rather than the way they did. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'd I'm glad you pointed that out, Judge Reimer. Although uh, there may appear to be some ambiguity in the regulation, the government has never argued that the regulation is ambiguous. It's only begun doing that now before this court. Well, this your, your position in, in the, in, during the proceeding was that it was there were two possible interpretations. I, in the best defense I could provide my client, I managed right. to, you know, wring some sort of a possible okay. interpretation out of it that might allow him to stay in the, na in the uh, Navy. But I really, uh, that issue, although I argued it before a military board, has been resolved in this circuit. Um, the Pruitt decision clearly, I think, really unambiguously says which interpretation is proper. And I, I'd like to point out that in district court proceedings, the government acknowledged to the district court, not status, not some ambiguous thing, the government acknowledged to the district court that orientation is the, mater is the, the critical evidentiary issue upon which the regulation turns. In oral argument before the district court, the district court said, well, what would Petty Officer Meinhold have had to do to stay in the Navy? Wouldn't he have had to, in effect, change his sexual orientation? It's not quite going to my question, though, which is, I know what the government said each time it said something, and it's sort of different, but, but my question is, if there is a possibly constitutional interpretation available, whether or not the government pushed it at any time mm -hmm. during the course of the proceedings, uh, to what extent, given the deference that we are supposed to uh, confer on the, on the military, shouldn't we give them a shot? at a constitutional interpretation. Judge Reimer, I think you should defer to their interpretation if it makes sense. But let's think about it. This regulation says you can say you're gay, you can engage in homosexual conduct so long as you're not a homosexual. If you are a homosexual, it doesn't matter what you do, you're out. Now, does that sound like a regulation that's attempting to target conduct or some side of sort of likely conduct? No. I mean, the best indicator of whether people are going to engage in conduct is probably whether they have engaged in it in the past. And yet, the regulation permits the retention of service members who do engage in conduct, provided they prove that their sexual orientation is heterosexual. It seems to me, and I, I think this, it, this issue was resolved by the Stefan Court, um, also lower district courts, since our court's judgment in the Dahl case by Judge Schwartz in Sacramento, by the Selland Court and by the Elsie Court in the D.C. Circuit, all of these courts have come to the common conclusion, as I believe this court already has in Pruitt and Schoengert, that the ultimate evidentiary issue under this regulation is orientation. As uh, Judge Norris said in the dissent in Watkins, what it attempts to do is pinpoint anything a homosexual might do, make that a basis for discharge, provided the service member can't prove that they're not a homosexual. I think that this, I don't know if it satisfies you, Judge Reimer, but I think that this shows that the government's interpretation just doesn't make sense. And although courts should defer to a government's interpretation of its own regulation, it shouldn't do so if it looks like it's a contrived and twisted interpretation late, you know, derived late in the day in an effort to try to save a regulation that a district court has already found to be unconstitutional and that the D.C. Circuit has found to be unconstitutional, as have three other district courts. What the government... Uh, Mr. McGuire, if yes, I may, um, suppose the regulation is, as you say it is, uh, simply, if you are a homosexual, you're out, okay? Now, and we got to realize we have to give deference to the, uh, to the Navy and these kind of things and running the armed forces and that sort of thing. Uh, is it, wouldn't it be true that if we separated all of, uh, all, all people into homosexuals and heterosexuals, as the only classes we had, uh, wouldn't it be true that homosexuals would be more likely to engage in homosexual conduct than heterosexuals would be to engage in homosexual conduct? 
that would completely depend upon what the circumstances are. And as Judge Reimer properly pointed out to the government counsel, when something is made criminal or when you risk your 13-year career in the Navy based upon it, then you're going to use your judgment and your free will to decide what you do or don't do. But I also... Well, then I think your answer to the question is that might be, but if the homosexual conduct were contrary to military regulations or illegal, when you factor that into the equation, then you cannot say that homosexuals, just because of being homosexual, are more likely to break the law or break the regulation and engage in homosexual conduct. Th that is correct, Judge Thompson. There are other holes in that argument as well, though. As well, the, now, the Ben Shalom case seemed to go, in the Seventh Circuit, seemed to follow that argument and said that the military didn't have to take the risk, as I recall. That's correct, Judge Thompson. And in fact, the Ben Shalom case, I mean, there are a lot of problems with it, but what I think the main problem is sort of the, the philosophical assumption underlying the case, and by that I mean this. Mm -hmm. In Ben Shalom, the Seventh Circuit sort of came to a decision that what homosexuals do is engage in homosexual conduct. What the whole thrust of our case and what the evidentiary record in this case demonstrates is that what homosexuals do is they're doctors, lawyers, teachers, sailors in the Navy. As a homosexual, you're a full human being and you make judgments and rational decisions that a human being does about what you can or can't do. And I don't want the, the government to sort of lead you astray by trying to narrow the conduct issue to this idea of, quote, homosexual conduct, which they define in a certain way under the regulation. Because what the government is arguing in its briefs is that this regulation is about trying to deter sexual misconduct. Because misconduct has some sort of a direct correlation to good order, morale, discipline within the military. And I believe that the military ought to be given wide latitude in proscribing conduct. But let's just take a look at what sexual misconduct in the military constitutes. Things like indecent assault, wrongful cohabitation, fraternization, indecent language, sexual harassment, pandering, prostitution. There's a whole list. And I'd like to point out to you that of those, at least two can only be committed by heterosexuals. Those include adultery and bigamy. Before the district court, the one that the government liked and relied upon was the sodomy statute. Well, the sodomy statute applies to heterosexuals and homosexuals. And as the record evidence demonstrates, it's overwhelmingly committed by heterosexuals in the service. But this is part of the sort of myth, as Judge Hatter pointed out, the myth and false stereotype that, under, that underlies the reasoning in this regulation and which the government relies upon to defend it has to do with what gay people do, that they are somehow unable to control their wanton expressions of sexuality. A DOD report came to this exact same conclusion. One of the DOD's own studies said that what underlies our regulation, this is the DOD's own report, is that there is some sort of an Im imagery under underlying it that that homosexuals will pollute the social environment with unrestrained and wanton expressions of their deviant sexuality. Well, the military's identified things it doesn't want service members to do. Those infractions can be committed by heterosexuals and homosexuals. It simply doesn't make sense for the government to identify a segment of the population, a group of its membership, and say, you people are the ones who are likely to commit these infractions, particularly when the evidence demonstrates that it's quite the contrary. So I want you to be careful not to fall into that trap. Uh, I think another, you know, there are at least two ways that I think the government really relies upon these false impressions and attempts to foster them as a way of winning this case. And I think it's sad. One example is that the government, it's not a mistake that the government spent a half a page excerpting quotes from a student evaluation that had been written about Petty Officer Meinhold. And in that quotation, the student, through innuendo, tries to raise the possibility that Petty Officer Meinhold may have made an improper sexual advance toward him. The government I spent... him over to dinner, or that's the one you're talking about? When you go to the next page in the record, Judge Thompson, mm -hmm. you find out that what Petty Officer Meinhold did was he invited him over to his house for Thanksgiving dinner, along with the rest of the class, along with his neighbors and their parents and friends. He was having a big Thanksgiving Day party for people in the area who were away from home, and that's all it was. And the Navy investigated it and came to the conclusion that that's all it was, and the government acknowledged in district court proceedings that the incident and the evaluation are completely irrelevant to his discharge. So why did the government waste a page of its brief excerpting from that? Because it wants to plant that seed in your head that that's who gay people are, that they do improper things like that. That's why the government relies upon the Solario decision of all things to try to defend this regulation. I'll remind the court that the Solario decision was a Supreme Court decision that concerned 
a service member named Solario, who was a pedophile, who abused the minor children of fellow service members while they were off at work. That has nothing to do with this case. In fact, the government made a critical mistake because the fact is that Solario was a heterosexual. But maybe that was a detail that they missed when they were going to decide to use the case. This isn't about misconduct. It isn't about people doing things they shouldn't do. The point of this whole case is that Petty Officer Meinhold wants to follow the rules. He wants the rules to apply to him. He served for 13 years in the military, obeying those rules, meeting and exceeding expectations. And all he wants to be able to do is continue doing that. He wants to be judged based upon how good a sailor he is and his conduct, not who he is, and not fears and misapplied stereotypes by people who don't know him about the way he might be or their concerns about things he might do. This is about such a fundamental issue under our Constitution, which is should the when the government issues a set of rules, shouldn't we all be equally culpable? Shouldn't we all, shouldn't the, the, the standard be set at the same height for everyone? He wants to follow those rules. He just wants to be given the opportunity to do it. As I understand Mr. Meinhold's position is that he, he, he doesn't question that conduct itself could be the valid basis for, for, the, for the military policy. That's correct, Judge Scopel. Uh, then does he have any objection or what would his position be if, if it, as, of, as I understand, the new implementation or new implemented policy will, will provide? And that is that there will be a disputable presumption, which uh, any member having uh, an announced homosexual or orientation uh, could come forward and say, but I do not intend to engage in it. I don't have any desire to. Uh, what, what's, what's, his, what's his position with reference to that? Right. Well, Judge Scopel, as I said earlier and as Judge Reimer pointed out, that, that's not the regulation that is the subject of this appeal. Um, I'm ready to fight that battle when we come to it. Whether the government can create some sort of a regulatory presumption that certain members will violate rules and others won't, whether that's constitutional or not, I think is highly questionable. Not only that, presumptions must be rebuttable. Okay? Under this regulation, a mere desire to do something is an adequate basis, even under the government's interpretation, if I could, this goes back to your point, Judge Reimer, under, the government argues that the, the definition of homosexual is the standard that determines whether to be discharged. Please remember that that definition says desire. The mere desire to do something is a basis to be discharged. Now, if there is a presumption that simply because you have certain thoughts, you will engage in that, and that you then have to come into a quasi-judicial proceeding and disprove your thoughts, disprove your intentions, I don't know if that really is a rebuttable presumption. It may very well be irrebuttable, because I don't know if that can be proven by a preponderance of the evidence to a fact finder. So I think that there are problems as to whether a rebuttable presumption of the type that appears to be embodied in the new regulation is going to be constitutional Well, or I not. sort of preface this based on conduct. If the, if the regulation pertains only to conduct, not to status, but only to conduct, then the right to come forward as far as uh, refuting any presumption which may be created by virtue of conduct uh, I think that very well might be constitutional, though. I mean, if it's, if it's not a propensity, but rather actual conduct, Judge Scopel, is that your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that could very well be constitutional, but I think that what you'd have to then look at is, is that regulation in identifying only homosexual conduct, is it really attempting to proscribe an area of conduct so as to best maintain good order, morale, and discipline in the military, or is it really attempting to target a group of individuals again? So I think that it, it presents new equal protection problems that are not present that we need not deal with in this appeal. And I think that that will probably be the next step along the line. We'll have to decide whether or not the government is still trying to target individuals by identifying a specific type of conduct. Uh, I mean, if, by way of example, you'll notice I, I ran through a, a, a rather burdensome litany of sexual infractions in the military, and I apologize for wasting so much of the court's time. But I think it's important because you look at all those infractions, each one of them is a basis, not for discharge, but criminal prosecution in the military, and none of those questions are ever asked. Do they ask service members whether they're likely to engage in any of those infractions, or whether they have a desire to, or whether they're in a class of people of whom it is commonly thought that they do engage in those sort of infractions? No. 
I mean, there's a specific reason for this regulation. It was to find out who the homosexuals are and get them out of the military. That's the purpose of this thing, as, as simply stated as possible. If I, I know I'm way over, but I'm wondering if I could address the injunction only because it is the main point of the government's case. There's to be no objection from the bench. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I think the government fundamentally misunderstands what the purpose of Judge Hatter's injunction was. Judge Hatter wasn't trying to take this case, turn it into a class action, and then offer relief to every person under the sun. He was, he was within his discretion, and the standard is abuse of discretion. He was trying to offer my client the proper remedy. And what he was doing was, he was offering my client the opportunity to go back into the Navy, continue his outstanding 13-year career in an environment where, as a matter of formal policy, gays and lesbians are not excluded and shunned from the military. The military is a community. It's important to fit in. It's important to be able to work with people. I agree with all of the testimony that we've all watched on C-SPAN over the last six months. I, I hate the result. I agree with the testimony from having been in the military and from having listened to Petty Officer Meinhold's descriptions. I mean, you've got to work with people. Well, how can you work with people if you're back in the Navy trying to and the Navy's formal rules say you shouldn't be there, but you just happen to be because some crazy judge in Los Angeles ordered you back into the Navy? Does that really give you a reasonable opportunity to rejoin the service, to become part of the fighting team again? I don't think so. So what Judge Hatter did was he issued an injunction telling the Navy to, to end the policy and allow for the existence of a discrimination-free environment where he could go back in as part of the team, where he wouldn't be blackballed and singled out because his mere presence violates Navy policy. Well, why wouldn't that be redressable assuming that the injunction runs only uh, to mine hole. I mean, the Navy's post-injunction conduct uh, could be taken care of by further supervising by the district court, just right. so far as Mr. Meinhold is concerned. Can that's, I that's right, Judge Reimer. And I think that the point you're raising is the exact same one the government does in its brief, where it says, treat him like any other job discrimination applicant. Those people get their remedy, they go back to work, that's fine. But what I'd like to point out to you is the important difference why that argument is wrong, and I think it addresses your issue as well. This isn't like other job discrimination cases, because the federal government does not, as a matter of formal federal policy, discriminate and exclude black Americans, or Spanish Americans, or Jewish Americans. But if I, under this policy, the correct analogy would be that the federal government excluded all Jewish Americans from a certain job. I happened to win a court case, and then I got to go back into the job. Is it a real remedy for me to be the only Jewish American in the, this entire structure? For me to sort of sit in my office, having been labeled different from everybody else, and when you pick up the books and you read what the organization is about, it has a specific section in it that says, I shouldn't be there. Is that a real opportunity for me to retake my job? I don't think so. And so even though you could order the Navy to do this and that and the other thing with regard to Petty Officer Meinhold, without getting rid of the policy, the thing you can never really offer him is the, the ability to go back and be part of the team. I think Judge Hatter understood that. Well, wouldn't that flow from declaring the policy unconstitutional, which was what Judge Hatter did, but he also then went beyond that, and I think that's where Judge Reimer's questions were going. Oh, is it, it may have to do with the amendment of the injunction rather than its scope as to other individuals. Is that correct? Yes. I'd well, like to. Well, its scope is to other individuals, and scope is to maintaining files pertaining to mm -hmm. you know, the whole military. The issue, what I've been and pertaining to enlistment, <coughs> which really isn't an issue here. Yeah, yes, Judge Reimer. The, what I've been addressing so far is the fact that the uh, injunction uh, proscribes the government's conduct with regard to all service members as opposed to just Petty Officer Meinhold, and I, I, I've attempted to address that. What I'd like to talk about are the additions that were made to the injunction. These were made for a very specific reason, and I would just like to put it in context for the panel, if I may. Uh, this isn't the first order that the district court issued to the Navy. It issued a preliminary injunction asking them to reinstate Petty Officer Meinhold, and they refused to do it. And they disobeyed the district court, and they only obeyed it after he hauled them into court and threatened them with contempt sanctions. And so grudgingly, they put him back in. And then later, the district court sanctioned the government for making misrepresentations to the court in, in open argument. And now the district court issued another order. And what the government did was it attempted to obey a narrow interpretation of the order, but circumvent it through other actions. 
And what the government did is, although it was forced to take Petty Officer Meinhold back, it denied him adv advancement and told him the reason he was denied advancement is because he's gay. It gave him failing scores on evaluations. And right on the evaluations, they state as the basis for his failing score the fact that he is a homosexual and the military still excludes other homosexuals. And I think this gets to your issue. The technical basis for his failing score was fails to support Navy policy. Okay. Yeah, but isn't all of this, as Judge Reimer indicates, redressable under the uh, post-injunction uh, conduct? Well, as to Beinhold. Yeah, okay. I, what I was attempting to do was explain why the order began to expand beyond simple discharge and encompassed additional things like giving scores on evaluations and other things, okay? I think that the, I was talking about Meinhold's failing scores on his evaluations, Judge Thomas, Thompson, and I think that that indicates another reason why it was important for the district court to issue the injunction that it did. Petty Officer Meinhold was in doing the job, they were not discharging him, and they may not have even been discriminating against him, but his mere presence was a violation of Navy policy. And so he got a failing score on fails to support Navy policy. And the grader said, sorry I have to do this, you're a great petty officer, but the fact is we still ban gays and you happen to be gay, so sorry about that. And I think that that evaluation goes a long way towards showing what I've been going on and on about, which has to do with this teamwork group aspect. He's not part of that group. And his mere presence, so long as there is an unconstitutional policy banning all other gays, so long as that policy exists, he's not really part of that group. And that's why he got that failing score. And that's why I think the district court was I, issuing... I think you've answered the question, Mr. McGuire. Yes, sir. I, are there any other questions? appear to be no other questions from the bench. I think we'd better hear from Mr. Levy now. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Judge Thompson. Thank you. Um, several points. First, uh, uh, Mr. Meinhold's lawyer complains about the evidence in the record and points to a number of studies. Under Heller, of course, the burden is on him to show that the policy is irrational and the government is entitled to defend on any conceivable state of facts and doesn't have to submit empirical evidence or materials in the record for judges to make factual findings. That's coupled here with the doctrine well established in this and the Supreme Court of deference to the military. So this case is judged under a rationality standard giving extraordinary deference to the military uh, as the court has held in cases such as Roscoe and <coughs> Goldman. And I would use Goldman as an example uh, of a different point as well. The theme of Mr. McGuire's argument is that this is prejudice and discrimination against gays. And for the reasons that I gave in my opening argument, we don't think that's right. And uh, the Supreme Court's decision in, in Goldberg is instructive on that. That was the case, you'll remember, where the military banned the wearing of a Jewish skull cap, a yarmulke. And the Supreme Court upheld that on an argument of uniformity, which is very similar, I think, to the unit cohesion argument that's at issue here. But the point centrally is that no one took that to be discrimination against Jewish people or the Jewish religion. There was a distinction between the conduct that the military could uh, prohibit and the uh, people to, to whom uh, th uh, the regulation was being applied. A closer analogy, though, would be to a statement by him, I am Jewish. But the statement here, as I said before, is a pro I said before is a proxy for conduct, and it is not well, true. So if you say I am Jewish, then you're going to make an assumption that they're going to wear uh, a prohibited article of clothing. No, that's not what was done there, uh, and it's not what was done here. Mr. McGuire made the statement, uh, if I understood him correctly, that says if you're homosexual, you're out. And that simply is not the basis for the military's policy. It's not what it says, and it's not what's been done. Uh, there is a rebuttable presumption in the regulation, as we talked about before. There is this example of the celibate homosexual. Mr. Meinhold was given an opportunity at his uh, discharge proceeding to show that he should be able to stay in, notwithstanding the statement of his homosexuality. Uh, I would also say that none of this is newly minted in this court. In fact, the Ben Shalom Court uh, accepted our position not only as to what the regulation is, but as to its constitutionality, as did the Woodward Court. So this has been the government's position for quite some time, and one that has been accepted by courts uh, in other cases. Do we have any uh, law in our circuit that would uh, preclude us from following Ben Shalom? I don't believe so. Mr. McGuire said that Pruitt is controlling, and I, I guess I have two basic points about Pruitt. One is that we don't think Pruitt, in its active form of rational basis review, survives Heller. 
uh, and certainly not in the military where deference is due. Moreover, the portion of the Pruitt decision that talked about status, I think, was, was directed to a much different context. That was a First Amendment issue, and the court was drawing the distinction between conduct and speech as the ground for discharge. And the court said because he wasn't discharged for speech, uh, then there wasn't a First Amendment uh, uh, objection. But that wasn't directed to the issue that you have here, which is the more focused equal protection question of whether the basis is not speech, which we would put to one side, but whether it is conduct on the one hand or status on the other. And I would note that in that case, the court first cited Ben Shalom favorably, which makes it clear that it's a conduct. I'm sorry? Or Heller. Uh, Pruitt, I'm sorry. Pruitt, Pruitt cited Ben Shalom. And the, uh, uh, order from this court. The mandate was simply a remand because the complaint had been dismissed on its face. So I don't think this court's decision in Pruitt stands for any firm propositions about status. Now if I could say just one word about the injunction. Uh, despite Mr. McGuire's efforts, I haven't heard a single word why this injunction should be extended to people other than uh, Mr. Meinhold. It is also grossly intrusive and overbroad in a lot of its particular respects, and those are most objectionable insofar as they apply to the new policy that hasn't even been the subject of adjudication. All right, uh, Mr. Levy, and there are no other questions. Thank you very much. I'd like to, uh, in speaking for uh, the bench, uh, compliment uh, Council on the uh, really outstanding uh, job that you've done in uh, briefing this case in preparing uh, for your arguments and presenting your arguments today. It's very helpful to this court and it's comforting to know that we have such fine uh, counsel uh, representing interests so important to us and to our country. So uh, the bench compliments uh, all of you. Thank you very much. The case just argued will stand submitted and we will be in recess until 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. The military's discrimination ban against gays was narrowed to apply only to Meinhold while this case is on appeal. America and the Courts is C-SPAN's weekly program about the Supreme Court and legal issues. It is seen each Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, 4 p.m. Pacific Time. Join us next week when we will take a look at the issues in the U.S. Supreme Court case Turner Broadcasting versus the Federal Communications Commission. For more information about the federal judicial process, C-SPAN offers Justice for All, a booklet about the Supreme Court's history and its influence today. For a copy,